you, Teresa, and thank you to you, Nadir, uh, particularly to Kirsten and Ty for, for putting up with me, I suppose, over the course of preparing the manuscript. Also, thanks to, to the French government for the opportunity to explore this idea further, um, and I, I do hope it goes, it's useful. Um, so, to provide a bit of context, this is what I plan to talk about. Uh, this is available in the book, which uh, has been mentioned before. Um, I'm not quite sure whether it's going to be available in all good bookshops quite yet, but it's available on a good website, so please do go and have a look if you're interested. Uh, just to provide a bit of an introduction, uh, the, the context has been summarised by the previous speakers, but I really thought it would be useful to explain what I'm talking about in terms of peer review. It's important to be clear I'm not talking about an academic mechanism for quality control in publications but rather something which is particular to the practice of international organisations and which has been defined by Pagani of the Legal Office of the OECD as a systematic examination and assessment of the performance of a state by other states with the ultimate goal of helping the reviewed state improve its policymaking, adopt best practices and comply with established standards and principles. This is something which is widely used in a number of different areas. These include, for example, good governance in the African Union. Uh, the OECD has a number of different peer review mechanisms, including one looking at, for example, development assistance. Uh, the two I really wanted to concentrate and draw your attention to are the Financial Action Task Force, Mutual Evaluation Mechanism, and then the International Atomic, Agen Atomic Energy Agency's Integrated Regulatory Review Service, IRRS. So to take the first one, the IRRS peer review is designed to strengthen and enhance the effectiveness of the national regulatory infrastructure of states. These are not inspections or audits, but rather it is a peer review evaluation conducted by expert teams who are selected by the IAEA um, from IAEA member states. Uh, just to provide a little bit of indication of how widely these are used, Countries shaded in darker brown are those that have already been subject to an IAEA IRRS uh, review. Sorry about the, the acronyms there. Um, it's also apparent that in the IAEA's 56th General Conference this year, that India is in the process of preparing to request a peer review mechanism, uh, a peer review. So there are a couple of points I'd really like to draw from this example. Firstly, these, this, this approach recognises that there is no one-size-fits-all and has been constructed to allow for variation in states, in states' culture, in the levels of financial support, and a number of other factors. It's also modular in the sense that states can select different modules they want to have addressed. These include, for example, governmental, legal, and regulatory frameworks for safety, or human resource development, and there are a number of other examples. Of particular interest, they also include on-site inspections, to provide some further examples, in 2011, reviewers held interviews with staff at Limerick and Salem nuclear power plants in the US. In the case of the UK, there was a visit to the Sellafield nuclear plant. In China, the IRRS team visited a number of facilities, whereas in Iran, the IRRS reviewers were invited to the Bushir nuclear power plant. This is normally conducted over the course of four phases. In the first phase, as the self-assessment process, in which the country under review completes a questionnaire. This is followed by on-site inspections and further research done by the reviewing team, which concludes with the completion of a report, including recommendations, and a f an action plan. This is followed up, and I think this is quite an important component, in the years after the review process is, and the report is presented, there is a follow-up follow process in which states are evaluated to see how much progress they are making in responding to some of the areas identified as needing more attention. The second example is that of the Financial Action Task Force, which conducts mutual evaluations, which is designed to evaluate whether the necessary laws, regulations, or other measures required under the essential criteria are in force and effect, and that there has been a full and proper implementation. These evaluations are carried out, are carried out around the globe the map only indicates the reports from countries which I found on the first 50 web pages, uh, 50 web pages of the, um, the FATF's website. So there are many more. A couple of points I wanted to raise in this, method, this approach. It's a performance evaluation rather than a checklist, and I think this is something which is important. It asks not the question, do you have this, but rather seeks to ask, how do you do this? And this helps in moving beyond a one-size-fits-all approach. 
Related to this, assessors are cognizant of the different countries that different countries adopt different approaches to implementing FATF standards, and assessors are encouraged to avoid narrow comparisons with their own approaches, their own national approaches. It also integrates the view of the private sector, and this includes meeting with, meetings with private sector individuals without government officials present. And as part of this, the on-site visit is seen to provide the best opportunity to clarify issues and also to review the effectiveness of systems in practice. Another couple of points are that it includes some form of space for private consultation and clarification between the reviewers and between the states uh, before the publication of reports. And also, interestingly, it applies graduated peer pressure upon states under review. The question that leads to is, so what? But I would suggest that if this is good enough for all those organisations, then could not there be scope for trying to bring this into the BTWC? There are a number of ways in which this could be achieved. Uh, really, the idea I developed in the book is just one approach um, based on some of the, the review of the other uh, peer review mechanisms employed. One of the things that struck me as particularly useful was to try and build on the modular idea. So that is, states can select which areas they want to be addressed, which areas they want to have reviewed. Um, and this would be as part of a voluntary peer review process. Following the selection of modules, one could envisage a preparatory phase in which there would be <clears throat> the scheduling of events, the collation, collection and translation of materials, and perhaps even a national survey in some circumstances. There's perhaps much to learn from the Canadian, Czech and Swiss initiative um, in terms of the collection of this data. This could be followed by visits. For example, if you wanted to look at biosecurity and biosafety measures, and how these measures function in practice, a visit could be a really useful approach. I do realise that the proposal to go back to visits may cause an allergic reaction amongst seasoned followers of the Convention, but it's perhaps worth pointing out that this is or has become normal within the IAEA process. And moreover, it's perhaps worth keeping in mind that in the decades since the collapse of the protocol negotiations, that Larger biotechnology companies are perhaps more familiar with third-party assessments and audits through, for example, occupational health and safety assessments. So it's perhaps something to look at. And moreover, visits would only be initiated at the behest of states. Part of the states. Um, following this, there will be a period of reflection, and then, according to this particular model, the data collected could be assessed against some form of pre-agreed baseline data or some form of criterion, perhaps using the meeting of experts discussion and meeting of states' parties' conclusions. This could be followed by a consultation and clarification phase, and I think this is something which is important. It could also be linked, in the cases where there were serious deficits or serious gaps identified, to the provision of assistance to respond to fill gaps, perhaps a mechanism which could be used to populate the database not just for states under review, but to open up channels of, of delivery of assistance for all states' parties. And there will be a process of discussion and publication review, and it could be followed up with some means of um, post-publication monitoring to see how people respond to the recommendations. So there are a number of advantages and disadvantages that I would see to this sort of model. I won't go into all of these, um, but space for clarification and consultation could appeal, appeal to states a mechanism for sharing best practice and enhancing nat national implementation through identifying gaps. It's also flexible and scalable, uh, which I think is important in a world where there is no one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, it can provide outreach and engagement. It takes the convention to the country and at the local level, provides scrutiny and peer pressure, and could help in actually beginning to look at technical cooperation should people want to uh, adopt a sort of international cooperation module it could be a means to look at how, um, how development aid could be provided most effectively. There are, of course, disadvantages. Um, it would require resources and this magical political will which people talk about. There would also require states to expose themselves to a degree of scrutiny, which may not be something which is particularly popular. And it may also serve as a distraction from broader processes that are going on. And I think these are important things to keep in mind. It would also require a number of prerequisites to move forward, and this includes things such as the identification of peers, the identification of baselines from which to compare assessments. Uh, so there are a number of factors which would be important. Um, very much aware that the multilateral disarmament and arms control community of practice is cautious and conservative. Unfortunately, many of the areas you're addressing 
are evolving in a manner which is considerably less circumspect. Particularly changes in science and security, in my personal view, make the nurturing of the Convention more important in the 21st century. In this regard, whilst it would be remiss not to acknowledge the many benefits of a decade of intercessional work, it's questionable whether the outcome of the Seventh Review Conference is enough, uh, whether discussion and promotion of common understandings is sufficient to tend to the health of the Convention. This is not to suggest that states' parties should seek to return to a protocol, but perhaps engage in a process of disaggregating verification and look at what steps could be achieved now without straying into politically divisive areas. The peer review mechanism strikes me as one process to achieve this, one process to achieve this, and nurturing the Convention back to health through a systematic review of a state's party's implementation of the Biological Weapons Convention by other states' parties. Um, I have outlined some steps as to how this could be achieved in the book, which goes into some more detail. One of the most, well, perhaps interesting angle would be to try and trigger a pilot process with a collective of interested states. But perhaps more important that than a pilot process would be for states' parties that are curious or keen to actually go back to capitals and see how peer reviews are implemented in other issue areas. Many of your colleagues will, will have already experienced some peer reviews in the different areas, like uh, finance, the, the uh, terrorism, <coughs> anti-terrorism legisla uh, legislation or anti-terrorist funding. So it's a case of doing homework and seeing what are the benefits from experiences in other areas. And with that, thank you very much for your time and good luck with the proceedings here.